Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the National Q1 performance uh, highlights and what to what to expect ahead. My name is Sean O'Brien. I'm the president of QuickRate. And uh, as you, some of you may have known from previous webinars, I'm also director in a small community bank uh, in Illinois. And you know that you know helps inform a lot of the things we do here at QuickRate. Uh, you know, we're actually users of our products, and you know, it gives us good feedback to not only what all of you are experiencing, uh, but also trying to design products and services that we think uh, can be can be helpful. Uh, so we start this presentation every time with uh, you know just a, a, a little bit of a breakdown of what the QCBI is and just the bank population uh, that we're that we're talking about. Uh, so as many of you may know, the, Quick Analytics, the QCBI index is the Quick Analytics Community Bank Index. And what we do is we've taken the definition that the FDIC used in its December 12 community banking study, uh, which really defined what a community bank is, and used that as a basis for our analysis. And the reason we do it is, uh, in our mind, very simple. Uh, the FDIC does a, a wonderful job of putting out quarterly information for the banking industry, but in our opinion, given the fact that it includes all banks, uh, it really reflects what's happening at the largest banks in the country, which may or may not be in sync with what all of us are experiencing, but our feeling is, is that for community banks, uh, we really want to focus in on the performance of those alone. And so you can see we exclude 336 of those banks that don't meet that definition uh, that the FDIC laid out. We have a few additional qualifiers, but we're really trying to hone in on what's happening at the community bank level. And that's why we have uh, the QCBI index. And these reports are something that's available every quarter uh, through Quick Analytics uh, and Quicker. You can just uh, you can run those run these reports both at a national level and at a state level. Um, so the breakdown of, of the banks, you can see we lost another you know, couple hundred banks um, you know, last year. Uh, we've lost about you know, 35, I think, already this year. Um, you know, seven, almost 75% of the banks are under 500 million, yet you know, really only retain now a quarter uh, of the assets, even in the community, in a community bank uh, environment. Uh, two thirds of them are C-Corps, uh, majority of them are stock, some mutuals, and certainly some, uh, about an eighth of them are still uh, thrifts. Uh, we have all experienced over the last uh, 15 to 18 months, you know, pretty good uh, asset growth. As you can see here in the numbers, uh, the blue bars are obviously the, the, the calendar years, and then the green bars represent these most recent quarter uh, numbers. Um, so you can see this in this lower uh, graph, the asset growth. This is typically what we see, and you know, it's, it's, it's a good story and it's a bad story, right? I mean, in some ways, right, it's discouraging that the larger banks are always continually, consistently taking a larger share, uh, but it is good to see that every, you know, banks of every size are experiencing uh, growth. Um, you know, there is a smaller percentage that didn't experience any asset growth, and that kind of comes through even in a bigger way on the loan growth uh, chart you can see here. Um, I'm taking the optimistic viewpoint on this, that 40% of the banks had very little or you know, slow loan growth over the last 12 months, and that's what LTM stands for. Um, and in the expectation that they saw things were getting a little bit dicier and you know improved, we were later in cycle and they were improving underwriting standards and being stricter and more discerning about the loans. Um, so that's certainly a, a more optimistic approach than just not being able to experience loan demand, which to me, again, is one of the real challenges for the smaller community bank uh, as we go forward. Um, so we still have seen pretty good loan growth. I know in the first quarter uh, and even you know, here into the second quarter, for most banks, loan growth has been tied to the PPP loans uh, or modifications or just activity there. Uh, I know our little bank, we got uh, our payment from the SBA today, or 93% of the uh, payment, so that's uh, you know certainly going to positively impact numbers here in the second quarter uh, for banks. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what you know happens with loan growth as we move throughout the remainder of the of the year. Um, deposit growth uh, has continued to stay strong as well. Uh, the same kind of slope here in terms of that growth by asset size, and you know again over 20 percent of the banks didn't experience any deposit growth. Uh, as well. So, you know, a lot of positives in these. 
also just still the stunning, you know, this, the, just the realities of it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a competitive industry, uh, increasingly competitive, uh, and you know, we all have to continue to work hard to to be the best bank we can be. Uh, I thought, and I mentioned this again, you know, the banks, community banks, did a great job defending our NIM in 2019. It's it's almost hard to believe that over the last 24 months, you know, there was concern about you know certainly rates rising, and now that seems just to be a, a dream that uh, we've kind of reversed uh, and broken trend, and now seem headed for another extended period of time with low. Uh, interest rates. So uh, it was very encouraging that banks were able to hold on to that, and now we'll have to see what happens as we as we move forward. One of the things that we have done at, at Quick Analytics for the last three or four years is every year we've kind of looked at what what who you know at, at the top performers in the com community banking world, and then also what those numbers look like and what correlated or what was you know the correlations between uh, high performing banks and some of these uh, metrics and consistently in our analysis efficiency uh, and the efficiency ratio has been the highest correlating component to high performance and that was true again in 2019 while not as strong as it had been in the previous years it still is the number one correlating factor so I think it's always helpful to as we you know think about uh, what may lie ahead and how challenging times are for us that we don't lose sight of the fact as we're trying to introduce new technologies and do different things at the bank uh, going about our business in the most efficient manner uh, is 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 more critical than ever uh, it does oftentimes involve u utilizing and implementing technology but i think it's important to remember uh, that we have to not only seek out technologies, but we have to seek out technologies that we can actually implement effectively uh, in our bank. Uh, there, you, you know, anecdot anecdotally, we hear a number of times, you know, banks talk about softwares or, or solutions that they bought that they were never really fully able to get implemented, or the amount of time and effort it took to op actually implement them on an ongoing basis just reduced the effectiveness that they were designed to to assist. So I think it's something that we have to keep in mind is uh, we need to employ technology where we can, but we need to also self-assess our institutions and make sure we actually can implement that technology and then get it to the people who can help it the most. Because what we've also seen in our study is that the banks um, who are the high performers also pay their people well and use more technology. And again, we think the the the, the connect is there, right? If you give good technology to your most uh, to your best employees, they will deliver the performance and the productivity that you both want and need. Uh, net interest margin was a was the second most highly correlated uh, with performance in 2019. Loan yield was a a big factor for that, uh, and so. Uh, I think it, it will be an important component for 2020 as well, but certainly the last couple of years has grown, and, and that makes sense. Uh, you know, credit costs have been down. Uh, banks that have been able to pass on uh, higher loan yields have been the ones who've been able to generate margin and drive uh, performance. Um, Non-interest income is always a little bit of a wild card. Uh, Banks that have tremendous non-income generating franchises always have the ability to be high performing. Unfortunately for all of us, not all of us can you know, participate in some of those specialized areas. Uh, but uh, when you do have a, a franchise, whether it be mortgage, wealth management, SBA lending, trust management, uh, those when they're run well with uh, proper uh, you know, the, the highly qualified people, uh, those can generate uh, outsized uh, performance. What did not correlate? Uh, these have been, you know, consistently, uh, you know, in some ways surprising, but uh, not surprising as well. I mean, asset quality, the fortunate factors for the last three or four years, uh, even five years, we've been in a pretty benign credit environment. Uh, credit costs have gone down for most banks, uh, and as a result, that didn't really distinguish you as a high performer because ever nobody really had any asset issues. Uh, in the same way, up until this last year, where we thought things might start to change, uh, everybody's had a good deposit franchise. The cost of funds has been low for almost every bank. We did see over the last 15 to 18 months, you know, certainly rates rising, uh, and we you know, we thought we might 
you know, that might become a bigger differentiating factor. But now as rates have kind of fallen off the cliff again, uh, we may be back to a period of time where, you know, all banks have good solid dep deposit franchises and the challenge will be able to uh, keep those deposits now that the appetite for a little bit higher interest rates have been whetted, uh, we'll, you know, we'll probably face more competition from, from non-banks uh, about for those deposits. It's, um, you know, we had that, you know, uh, you know, perfect example of that in our bank this week. We were bidding on some municipal deposits that we've retained. Uh, last year we were paying 140, 150 for those. This year we renewed them for uh, 35 basis points. So, you know, a dramatic difference uh, in, in expectations in terms of cost of funds. And then finally, loan mix, it hasn't really correlated. Uh, you know, we always, you know, would expect that maybe mortgages or commercial lending would be required to be top performers. Um, but the fact of the matter is our top performing banks had loan mixes of all uh, shapes and sizes. So as we look at the first quarter numbers for performance, uh, you can see here the loan yields, the yield on loans has rolled over a little bit. Um, cost of funds in the same way, right? So, um, you know, this will be interesting to watch as the year goes on. I suspect this will probably drop pretty precipitously. Uh, and then it'll be interesting to see what that does to NIM. You know, will we be able to uh, expand our NIM, or will the yields on loans that we are able to charge uh, kind of correspond with this drop in cost of funds, and and we'll we'll lose that. So it'll be a big year uh, for all of us to try to defend uh, the NIM that we that we have. And and remind you, these are all median numbers, um, so they're the midpoint for the for the banks. Uh, we're big believers in medians. Uh, averages, again, kind of represent what's going on with the, the largest banks. Medians kind of really reflect what the midpoint is for the, for the industry. Non-interest income has been you know, kind of gradually dropping for most banks. And then the efficiency ratio, this is, a, you know, I'm hoping it's just a blip, but this would be problematic if we start to see a, a break in trend and, you know, return to a little bit higher efficiency ratios. In some ways, that's probably... Um, unavoidable, but I think it, it bears watching uh, that we're going to have to hopefully kind of hold, uh, hold our costs down as we enter a little bit more uh, difficult environment. All of this bears out in the profitability numbers. <clears throat> we see the uh, pre-tax ROA numbers rolled over here in the first quarter. Um, in the same way, the COE graph here <clears throat> represents core operating earnings. Um, that's a big driver, as you can see here in the definition. Uh, it's one of the uh, most important components that we think about here at Quick Analytics because it really represents uh, the ability for banks to generate earnings. Uh, it's really a, you know, essentially a pre-tax, pre-provision type of look at earnings. It doesn't factor in any credit-related or non-recurring items like loan loss provisions or gains or losses on uh, you know, securities, et cetera. And so it really kind of captures What's the ability for your bank franchise or any bank franchise to generate earnings? And so again, that's trouble. You know, it's 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 trying to you know the trend is trend line's broken, right? So now we got to see uh, you know what's going to happen here as the as the year goes on. Uh, as I mentioned, seven percent you know, percent of the banks here had a, a you know less than zero ROA, so that's certainly discouraging uh, because you know you have to essentially you know be honest about it that uh, you know, the best days, you know, are probably behind us here for a short, for some period of time, whether that's, you know, a year or two or not, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, I think it's clearly interesting and I think a very big positive that we've had so much stimulus into the system. Uh, if you think back to the 2007 crisis, it took nearly 200 to 300 days for, uh, you know, whether it was, you know, uh, government spending, you know, look, a lot of the uh, measures that the Fed put in place to get into the markets. You know, here in this crisis or, or, or recession, you know, less than 45 days and there was a ton of stimulus in. So that's really, you know, a big reason why we had the disconnect between the stock market and the economy. Um, you know, the stock market's, you know, reacting to all that liquidity being pumped in. Um, the economy, the reality is we still got 13 to 14% of the people unemployed, which is higher than what it was during the crisis uh, in, at the start of the, of the decade. So, um, you know, positives and negatives of both, but uh, 
you know, certainly we're we're going to enter in a more difficult uh, period of time than we've than we've been recently in, and that brings us back to these you know after tax ROA and ROE numbers. We can see and be reminded of where we were before the tax cuts, and now you know hopefully we're not returning to there even with the tax cuts. Uh, you know, down to these lower median ROA and ROE uh, numbers. So uh, again, we all have to be uh, vigilant and uh, and 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 again hope that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be able oops, be able to support uh, our borrowers here as we move forward. So what do I think about 2020? You know, certainly again, I think efficiency has been king, and I think will remain you know king. It has been the most correlating metric for top performance. Uh, I don't think that that will change. Uh, it may not be the most highly correlated, but it's certainly going to be a key component. I think this year, right, the divergence in credit quality will probably be a big indicator. As I mentioned. Over the past three or four years, really no one's had significant, if any, credit costs. Uh, that probably changes here and probably you know, is a pretty big determinant uh, of performance uh, for the next year or two. Who can defend their NIM? Uh, you know, with rates falling, it's going to be more difficult to pass on loan yields. Certainly our, our deposit costs will be better. Um, but who has been able to you know, not only maintain but potentially ex expand their NIM will probably be best positioned for top performance in 2020. Um, deposits, you know, again, while they've not been a differentiator over the last three or four years, um, they probably will continue to be because we'll all return to a, you know, a very low-cost franchise. Um, but the ability to, to continue and draw, to try and grow non-interest bearing deposits will be as important as, as ever. Uh, you know, currently, we are in a window where wholesale money is very cheap. I would suspect for many of you, it might be cheaper than your local market. Um, you know, so if you think about the, the, the measures that the government has taken, right, again, the Fed, uh, the home loan banks, you know, have all provided liquidity to, to banks. Um, they've provided it to, through the PPP program. A lot of that money came into our institutions even before the business is needed. It's now slowly running out. But it's created a window here where we've had a tremendous influx of liquidity into the system. And as a result, uh, the wholesale markets, uh, and, and just obviously because the, the treasury and agency markets are repriced, you know, it's, it's very cheap uh, for wholesale money. So it is and probably is worth some time to evaluate if you can take advantage of that, uh, of, of this, you know, this window we're in. Who knows how long it will last? But maybe you, you try to price out a, a longer-term deposit because really there's not much price difference today uh, you know, between a one, two, or three-year uh, you know, CD or just uh, you know, advance that uh, you know, it's, it's worth evaluating. Uh, will you have or want loan growth, right? Uh, obviously, all this uh, unemployment is going to decrease the number uh, and the pool of qualified borrowers. Uh, we certainly learned from last time uh, as, as in the the late cycle uh, loans, you know, con, con, you know, they, they represented the majority of the losses during the last crisis for banks, and so we're going to want to make sure, uh, you know, we're going to have to make a determination, you know, if if what what our lending criteria and underwriting standards are going to be, uh, obviously here later in the in the cycle. Uh, certainly, you want to take advantage of the, the downturn in mortgage rates to for refinancings and these government backed loans. And then with the payment of the, SP, uh, the PPP loans, this will probably, for some banks, really be outsized a uh, one-time influx of income this year, which could impact top performance for 2020 because depending on the, the amount of PPP loans you did, that 5% payment um, you know, can be, I think it will be significant for most banks, but it really could be tremendously outsized for those who wrote uh, a lot of these PPP loans. Um, the current credit environment, I want to thank David Ruffin and our IntelliCredit team for, for uh, the, the next few slides. Um, they did a webinar uh, last month and you know, certainly have been and already have been a tremendous resource for us at Quick Analytics and Quick Rate. Uh, we're, we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later in the presentation. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, yeah, they put together and they brought a tremendous amount of expertise around uh, credit and some of the thoughts that they've had uh, you know where we are right now is you know certainly this is the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Um, depending on where, you know, which uh, Bureau of Labor statistic number you want to look at, the bottom line is there's, there's a lot of unemployment. There's more un people unemployed today than there were even at the height of the last 
uh, crisis. So um, even though the stock market has disconnected, um, we do really have problems with people uh, and, and, and employment. And you know, how much worse it gets, I don't know. But I think it's now the question of how long will it take for all of them to, you know, to return to the labor market. You know, there's estimates of five years. Um, that's a long period of time um, for, for that number to wind down back to the 3.5% uh, where we were. Um, COVID brings a new, you know, a new cycle, uh, you know, among the many changes, right, just the disruption that it's brought, but it's going to certainly bring more challenges to all of us in the, 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 the credit arena. Um, the only, <laughs> if you can call it good news uh, through all of this, is this is not a banking crisis that, uh, that we created. I mean, obviously, last time uh, we were in some ways complicit or certainly got the blame for a lot of the problems that uh, resulted from the mortgage problems that resulted in the, in the last crisis. Um, this time, you know, this is, is certainly a, a black swan event, right, that there's, there's no blame in our industry. And um, it, we do right now come into it in a much healthier position than last time where there's, there's a lot more capital in the system, tremendous amounts of liquidity, uh, and then we all, you know, because of what we went through, are better in terms of our risk management policies and procedures. So, you know, it, it, it is going to be challenging, but I would say we're as, you know, as prepared as we've ever been or best prepared as we've been to deal with uh, what may come down the pike. Um, obviously, all of you are busy, um, you know, booking these COVID-related loans, you know, uh, and any kind of loan modifications. Uh, it has meant a tremendous amount of increase in loans uh, on the books for a lot of uh, institutions. Um, deposits, as we saw earlier, have been have been strong for most institutions as well. Um, but again, you know, regardless of that, we're just not, re you know, immune from these challenges, and so there's going to be a lot of risks that are, you know, haven't reared their head yet. Uh, but that we're, we're subject to and, and exposed to. So we're just going to have to continue to keep our heads down and work through it. Um, commodity valuations always impact credit quality, as David uh, Ruffin likes to say, right? Most of our problems in, in the past are credit problems or crises all, uh, all revolve around the fact of a commodity devaluation. Uh, last crisis, it was, you know, first, you know, one to four family real estate. Um, certainly we have to monitor and see uh, what you know? What areas? Obviously, oil uh, you know has had you know severe devaluations here uh, recently. We need to you know mine our portfolios and identify concentrations and correlations. Um, if there's particular industries uh, uh, or vintages of loans, we need to, to monitor and see how they're doing. Uh, be looking for risk made, risk grade migrations, particularly within the past category. Uh, we have to be able to mine and be able to see into our loan portfolios. Uh, with greater visibility than we have in the past um, to be able to identify as quickly as we can any issues that might be emerging or growing. Um, how this, you know, kind of manifests itself in some ways, uh, this is, again, uh, compliments of David Ruffin and our IntelliCredit team. Um, but I think the, one of the challenges and, and, you know, realities we have to face is the kind of the uh, just the approach of, of thinking that all good all loans are good until they're bad, right? We have to you know dig deeper, and before they show up on our call report, we've got to you know have ways to identify them and deal with them sooner if we if we can. Uh, we think as an industry, we've taken great comfort in most recently. Most of all of our loan reviews have been met with uh, you know high marks, and there's really been no downgrades. Um, but we can't necessarily take that as a proxy for future loan reviews and for credit quality. We, right now is when we need to really uh, dig down, identify any weakness that we potentially see, look for areas where you know, weaknesses might spread, and make sure we've got our arms around it and are able to deal with those borrowers uh, earlier uh, rather than later. Uh, as, as we've mentioned here uh, multiple times already today, you know, after a decade of low rates, we look like we're going there again. Um, who knows how long it lasts, but certainly the comments yesterday from the chairman of the Fed, um, you know, he doesn't see raising rates, you know, beyond or even even thinking about it till after 2022. Um, the likelihood is, is if, if it does take five years to uh, return people to the workforce, uh, I think it's, I think it's safe to say they're going to be more than patient and probably err on the side of keeping rates lower for longer. Um, so unfortunately, we are probably in a very extended uh, uh, low credit uh, environment uh, again. 
So, you know, that's going to, you know, be a backdrop for, you know, the immediate credit concerns that we already see. Um, obviously, uh, you know, retail industries, uh, the, 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 the retail strip mall, you know, are some areas of weakness that we'll probably uh, have to deal with in our own credit books. Um, certainly nonprofits, David has made mention of one of the side effects or byproducts of the tax cut is that uh, there has been less charitable giving the last couple of years. You would expect with what's happened this year, that's probably going to be true again this year. That puts pressure on any loans you might have to nonprofits or churches who uh, will probably see a lot of their uh, you know, donated dollars uh, go down. Uh, certainly colleges in the same way. If we've made loans to any small colleges, uh, we, we probably want to be uh, on top of that. Um, the ag sector, has, you know, being in the Midwest, it's certainly been a tough couple years for farmers. This year appears that it's going to be uh, uh, additionally uh, difficult, so we want to make sure we're uh, on top of any farmers who are entering the year having already carried over maybe for the last year or two. So needless to say, there are uh, certainly deposits uh, of challenges within everybody's loan book. Uh, being, being honest and you know, getting out there and you know, getting our heads uh, into the weeds and see what's happening is, is going to pay dividends down the road. Because um, the final uh, flag here, you know, the structural problem that smaller banks have is you know, another old adage, right, the first loss is your best loss. One of the challenges in the last crisis was that a lot of the smaller banks didn't have the ability to flush the problem loans like the larger banks did uh, for a number of reasons. One, there were community bankers. These are our friends. These are our community. Uh, we want to be patient with them. The, the problem, the flip side of that is uh, the longer we wait, typically the larger the loss is going to be. And so we have to make a determination you know, of how quickly we deal with these. And so the sooner we can identify them before they get problematic, uh, the better off it's probably going to be for all of us. Um, as I mentioned, we are entering this phase you know, as from a capital position in a much stronger position than we've entered most crises. Uh, crises? excuse me, um, in the past. So that's encouraging. And I think all of us um, within the industry have done a good job of, of, and, you know, of building capital. And so we, we do enter from a position of strength. Um, certainly the asset quality numbers have been good. Uh, you know, certainly declining here until we see a little bit of an uptick here in the first quarter. Um, I think we, this is encouraging to me to see as well that, you know, while the loan loss reserve was, was naturally declining as a percentage of gross loans, as, as times were good, I think we, this indicates to me, and I'm hopeful that it's going to be true, is that this time all of us know the reserve we got money into late. Um, it appears to me already in the first quarter banks are adjusting those qualitative factors to get more money into the reserve, uh, knowing that what, despite not having seen you know, immediate problems, uh, all the work that's being done around the, uh, the unemployment is, um, you know, and the challenges within the economy will certainly, um, you know, probably lead to some loan losses here in the future. And so, again, getting out ahead of those is, is a very positive thing. Um, just to reiterate with a few more slides, the loan quality for banks has been very strong. Uh, these just kind of illustrate it. Um, total non-performers, again, slightly ticking up here in the first quarter, but had been you know, on a pretty good downturn for the last four or five years. Um, again, the reserve uh, to loans is, is really good. Uh, you know, it's starting to tick up, but it had been a pretty healthy number. The only outlier, I would say, is the Northeast has a much lower reserve than almost any part of the country, which is uh, interesting to me, but um, we'll see what happens here. Uh, you know, as the as the year goes out, um, CRE uh, these you know represent the number of banks in each of the uh, regions who ha who are uh, under 10 billion but have over the 300 uh, percent guidance. Uh, the Midwest has the most. Uh, so certainly, again, if you are one of these banks or anywhere near the 300 guidance, understand that the regulators have been pretty clear. They don't mind you being over the guidance, but you should fully expect. Uh, the, you know, a much more rigorous and demanding exam cycle. Uh, and I think it's a fair, you know, it's a fair ask. We, we get to run the banks the way we want to, uh, but we should not be surprised if we are examined a bit more rigorously uh, with these higher concentrations. So, um, 
again, I, I think it's a I think it's a reasonable uh, request, uh, but we we shouldn't be surprised uh, from that. Um, so. As I mentioned before, we hired uh, David Ruffin, who uh, many of you have heard probably speak or worked with over the years uh, in the, uh, the loan review business or the credit risk management business. But David uh, and, and I got to, to know each other over the years, and we really felt there was a, a, a really good complementary value between what we were trying to do at Quick Analytics and what he's, he does at IntelliCredit. And what it starts with is we've, we have believed um, that you know, the public data that's available to us is an underutilized resource for community banks uh, in certainly you know providing us information about about our bank and the and the industry but in the in the loan business it's certainly the uh, idiosyncratic as David likes to say or the non-public data that really can tell you even more about what's going on within your within your portfolio and so what we try to start with and think about it is what we're doing with IntelliCredit is taking that public data uh, that might identify some red flags and you know provide us with some aggregate portfolio trends and marry that with drilling down into loan level detail um, through what we call a portfolio analyzer and ultimately you're know, landing in a smart loan review as well and and really bringing together all that public and non-public data to give us our best shot to understand what's happening within our loan portfolio. Uh, we have a product called Portfolio Analyzer and Smart Loan Review uh, that can assist our institutions uh, with, uh, you know, with this type of analysis. It involves sharing a loan tape or a flat file with us, uh, but it's something we certainly think can be beneficial uh, to most, you know, to every bank, and it's something that's very, you know, we believe, easy to implement utilize uh, and, and kind of a hallmark of quick rate. We want to bring you solutions that are easy to use and that are affordable and that banks of all sizes can can take advantage of. Um, so you know some of the things we've tried to do with even within quick analytics to, to, to get prepared and prepare our users for what's coming is we know later in the cycle uh, regulators start start to you know be cons be more interested and concerned about concentration. So we've updated a page within our Quick Analytics uh, credit section to be able to allow each of you to see your loan concentrations as a percentage of both Tier 1 capital and total risk-based capital. And so you can see those numbers on both an absolute and trended period of time, and then you can also make comparisons to peer groups, be that your UBPR peer group, a state peer group, or a peer group of your own creation. So meaningful peer groups, and then plus still be able to see your information over time. The call report, again, as I mentioned, we think is a valuable source of information. It clearly has limitations, but we do think there's some things that it can tell you that we think are worthwhile, and that, that pertains to the credit section as well. We've designed a credit risk matrix that we call, and, and what it speaks to is really three types of credit, or credit risk that we think the call report can show you in, in some ways in both an absolute and relative form. Uh, the first you know, me measure is really the current credit risk. And this is, uh, as we mentioned, um, the call report is backwards looking. So anything that we see from uh, visible on the balance sheet, such as non-performers, has already occurred. Uh, but we can still see that and what that number looks like both on an absolute and relative basis. Um, so that's meaningful if you're using uh, worthwhile and meaningful peer groups. The second piece, though, is the portfolio risk. And what that really talks to, it speaks to, is what's potentially the, the level of risk in your portfolio given your loan concentrations and overall leverage. You may not have any current losses now, but if you do have a high concentration of, say, ag loans, or you do have a high concentration of, uh, you know, commercial real estate that involves strip malls that are high, uh, retail based. You might have a much higher level of risk down the road that you might want to start to investigate. This can kind of highlight that. Where are there correlations? Where are there concentrations that potentially could be problematic for you and your bank as we move through the, you know, a much much more difficult uh, credit environment. And then the third thing is, is even though we come into this level or this you know, potential crisis with a great deal of capital and liquidity, we do still want to assess our ability um, you know, from a, as a bank to absorb losses through earning reserves and capital levels. So we can, again, see those numbers 
both on an absolute and relative basis. And then we can also you know, perform a portfolio level credit stress test to kind of see what's the level of cushion we have uh, before we'd run into any kind of capital problem. So there's a lot of information that call report information can provide, and we try to harvest a lot of that through quick analytics. Um, this is an example of one of the pages that we've you know, redone or created to, to, to address this. So this is an example of our credit risk matrix where we do focus in on the current credit risk components that you can see through the call report. And again, this would suggest a low level of current risk problems. Um, and again, up here you can see comparisons to a peer group, in this case an Illinois peer group. Here's the median, and then we kind of break it down into quintiles. And you can see these numbers both as an absolute percentage or as a percentile rank. But as we move down, you can see then that this bank um, has a little bit more in terms of concentrations, um, you know, right in line with overall leverages. But there are some concentrations that, uh, you know, that, that potentially, you know, could be a little bit concerning. And then we final, you know, finish that then with just looking at the ability to deal with any potential problems, uh, you know, through you know, uh, the reserves, which is kind of in line um, as a percentage of non-performers is higher. Um, core operating is kind of in line. But again, it just, it's, you know, kind of lets you know both on an absolute relative basis how your bank looks, you know, uh, compared to other banks as we get ready for, um, you know, this, this new environment. It has a number of reasons why it's important. The one of the ones I always focus in on is this is how your regulator is looking at you, right? They're often looking at you and the medians for your UBPR or a particular peer group. Not knowing where you stand with those can oftentimes lead to you know, misunderstandings about why something might be emphasized or de-emphasized in an exam. If you are below the median for the, your reserve, I don't care what the qualitative factors you know, suggest. Your examiner might say this number is not right, right? We can all agree or disagree on whether that's the right approach, but it's a practical approach. It, it, it happens. We can all speak to the times where this number gets moved because an examiner wants to see it higher. Um, we should know what this number is. If we're down here in a, in a lower, uh, you know, the, the lowest quintile and our current credit risk is higher, um, you know, we should expect a, to, to, to have people ask for, for more, uh, you know, the reserves to be added, you know, with Q factors. We marry that then with the, uh, the loan level transactions through IntelliCredit. And this is, again, why we're, we're very excited uh, for the IntelliCredit team. This takes that loan tape that you can share with us and allows you to drill down into any one of these categories to review your portfolio uh, any number of ways um, drill down into uh, you know not only custom reports but these snapshots, and then also incorporate uh, loan review uh, into that as well. So I'm going to just jump out real quick, um, just to take a second to show you what this all looks like. Um, so, for instance, on our IntelliCredit portal, uh, once you've downloaded a uh, you know a loan tape or a series of loan tapes for us we can put together a, a page and your information for you in this way. You're able to drill down into any one of these categories uh, if you want to see what's happening. You can, if you're tracking any of these loan quality indicators, then see your portfolio uh, as you know, defined by these. So if you're looking at risk grades, you could say, why are these four pass loans having so many pay issues? You can drill down and see those, see those numbers. If you're tracking, uh, credit scores, LTVs, debt service coverage, NASIX codes, any of these things you, you'd be able to see uh, your portfolio presented to you as well. Um, as I mentioned, you can look for risk grade distributions and, uh, and, and migrations. We have a tracker here for COVID-19 loans built uh, in terms or based on the guidance provided by the regulators. So uh, this is a way for you to easily track those COVID-19 loans and be able to share them with your regulator uh, when, when called upon. I think it's not, you know, it's not inconceivable that those loans might be with us a lot longer than we had anticipated. That certainly remains to be seen. And then you can, if you, whether you're doing it, you know, loan review internally or if you use an outside service like, uh, you know, IntelliCredit, then we can, they can actually, you know, with, if you're using us, we can provide you and incorporate into all this data then your individual loan review and uh, uh, reports. Um, you can also 
uh, clear exceptions during the, the loan review process. So we hope not only will it give you better information, but will make the whole process much more efficient than you have seen in the past. In terms of quick analytics, as I mentioned, we've developed this new credit summary uh, where you can see the credit risk matrix and then the other asset quality and concentration reports uh, that are available to you. Uh, those are all in addition to the, re the regulatory tools we already have available, such as a CECL solution, our credit stress test, a liquidity report, a capital planning tool, and then some of the peer reports that we provide uh, as, as well. Um, so as we get close to the finish here, I appreciate everybody's time today and in coming out. I'm always reminded uh, when I go in for my annual physical, my doctor likes to remind me, and you can't see my hands, but if you think about it, if you were to make a triangle with your fingers, he would always hold those up and still holds those up to me and says, Sean, it's all very simple. All you need to do is focus on your diet, exercise, and sleep. And those are all three very simple and straightforward things. And I, like maybe many of you, struggle with all three of them. But as he reminds me, they are all interrelated. So, you know, so cheating on one or uh, not dealing with one will have impacts on the, on the other. And I am certainly guilty of that. I'm thinking about the current environment in the same way, right? And I'm saying that capital asset quality and liquidity, obviously, as we all know, are all kind of interrelated. And issues with one can lead to issues with the others. And so, you know, our, my feeling is, right, changes to any of our asset quality can have enormous implications both on our liquidity and our capital. And so making sure we have reporting frameworks in place um, to measure and monitor these and, and make sure we're managing them effectively, I think are going to be very important as we move through this cycle. And as a result, we think now is the time to assess your credit risk, right? Uh, beyond the COVID, uh, you know, booking and, and monitor or coding of the, the COVID-19 loans, we're going to have to monitor those. We're going to have to monitor those borrowers. Uh, we are in a new and hopefully not too treacherous, but we are certainly into into a much more difficult uh, credit cycle. Uh, avoid the trap of managing by uh, trailing indicators. Again, these come uh, via our IntelliCredit team who who have been through these downturns before and, and you know, are, are really offering up a, you know, a lesson uh, of best practices um, to, to, give, you know, to, to give our banks the ability to deal with what, what may lie ahead. But avoiding the trap of only managing by you know, call report numbers or trailing indicators is not the way you want to do it. Um, you do have the power and the tools to be the captain of your own ship. We think that's more important than ever. We don't want the regulators to dictate how we manage uh, our banks. Um, so we have to be out in front of that first. And you do that by you know, making sure you, we fully understand our position that we're in. We need to quantify it, and we need to describe it. Right? We need to make sure we are uh, you know, not leaving the blank page, because they'll, they'll drive a truck through that. We've got to make sure uh, we are uh, articulating what kind of shape we are in and what we're doing to effectively and proactively manage uh, both our portfolio and our, and our borrowers. Um, as I mentioned, this is why we think the tools that we've built for you through Quick Analytics and IntelliCredit can help. Um, and we're very excited to potentially show those to you. Uh, we really do think we have areas that can you know, speak to any issue you have regarding liquidity uh, and certainly the asset quality and managing your loan portfolio. If, if you haven't had a chance to speak to David or don't know him, um, I certainly encourage you to reach out to him and his team, uh, Larry Poole and David Littleton, who come over to build IntelliCredit. Uh, they are available for loan review. They are available really for consulting projects. But you know, really, uh, the IntelliCredit portal will give you and your bank uh, a number of tools to, you know, again, we think, uh, more effectively and efficiently manage your, your loan portfolio. So I want to thank you all very much for attending today. Um, I'm going to check for questions in a second. Certainly encourage you to schedule a walkthrough with us, see how we can help. We'll show you your data uh, and see if there's something we can do. And again, remember, we're designing tools that are affordable so you, every bank, regardless of size, can afford, uh, can afford to, to use them. Um, we do have a couple of questions, or excuse me, one question uh, about the handouts. We will get you a copy of the slides, so later, uh, probably tomorrow, 
uh, we will send out, uh, or Monday, we'll send out an email with a copy of the presentation. And um, and if you need it sooner than that, just, just email and, um, immediately and we'll get that out. Um, so I'll just see if there's any other questions. Um, if not, I'll leave this slide up. I want to thank you all very much for uh, taking the time out of your busy day. I know it's difficult and unprecedented times in the banks. So we really appreciate you working with QuickRate. Look forward to potentially working with Quick Analytics and IntelliCredit, and hope you have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.